All right, so let's talk a little bit about stock options and some of the things that that I've experienced and learned watching the stock market day after day for over three years now. I actually was not a... I did some stock trading back in like uh, 1999, 98, 2000, and then the summer of 2000 kind of... Uh, made me stop for a while. And then when I joined the school here, I started learning Larry's system, studied it for over three years now, and became a full-fledged 100% stock options addict. So I want to share with you some ideas. Uh, I'm not an attorney or an accountant. I'm giving advice based on my experience and successes. I do not claim anything in this presentation as legal advice. Estate advice or tax advice, please feel free to check with your accountant or attorney for using any of these techniques discussed in this presentation or any techniques I ever discuss with you. And we can back that up with lawyers. All right. So one of the first things I do when I wake up in the morning, and I tend to wake up pretty early. I don't know why. I just do. Right? I usually am up about 6 a.m. I like to put on Fox Business. Fox Business, Maria Bartiroma, and Dagan McDowell. They're like my girlfriends. At least in my mind, they're my girlfriends. I like Dagan a little better than Maria, but I like them both. You know? and it, might, it might sound silly if you know I'm telling you, like I got a little thing for these ladies, but they... Um, they educate me. They tell me what's going on. They tell me about the, the stock market and what is in favor today and what is not in favor. It's really important information. They also are politically connected to me. They talk my language. I'm a conservative. I want to hear what the issues are. I want to know what they are. Those issues may have an effect on my investing decisions, not only with the stock market, but also the real estate market. I just found out, I don't know, I have to believe it was this week, I found out that the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Supreme Court decided to extend the moratorium on evictions again. Again. Landlords are losing $18 billion a month in Pennsylvania, and they extended it again. Makes you really wonder, uh, you know, what the heck's going on in this world. All right, so I watch Fox Business for the reasons I just mentioned, and the website that I tend to use is CNBC, because we, we use CNBC software here to evaluate charts. I'm used to looking at it, and... I have a long watch list of stocks that I'm watching, right? And I like to have this chart up in the morning. And there's a little button here on the right-hand side that says extended hours. So if you're not using this site, I use it in the morning. So if, if the button was clicked to the left, it would be telling you what the stocks closed the day before. If you move the button to the right, you're now seeing the futures market. Now the futures, it's six o'clock in the morning. I'm I'm hanging out with my girlfriends. And and this page is telling me what's due to be up today. Okay? So it'll be you'll see you'll see uh, if you push the extended, you'll see the stocks that are in your watch list, which ones are green, which ones are red. Red means that they're Futures are pointing down, and green means that they're going up. This is important information. So sometimes I'll look at that screen, and I'll say, and I'm already trying to evaluate what kind of day I might have in the market, right? And I'm doing this three and a half hours before the market even opens, all right? <laughs> so I'm a little early, but this is the first thing I like to do. I get up, I go down, I look at this. I want to know what I should do today. I'm already starting to think about what is a smart move for me today, okay? Okay. There's also multiple pages. So the first thing is like a watch list that I just showed you. This page 
is called a watch list. And this is so you can quickly just scan your eyes over the stocks that you're interested in. But this page is the list page, the middle page. I believe it's called the list page. And this page gives you a lot more information. One of the things that I like about this page is it's also telling me the extended hours if I choose to see that, right? I just click that button. But what it also does for you is it shows you this scale. Now, I really like this because, okay, so when we evaluate charts, what are we trying to find out? We're trying to find out if the stock is at a, a bargain basement price right now, does it make sense for us to buy it when it's cheap so that we can ride it up again, which is what we're doing most of the time when the stock option Sultan, a bigger version of this guy, who tells us what he reads in that chart and what kind of opportunities are there for us to, to take advantage of. But I like this chart very much because it's not chart reading, but you can tell right away, like if you looked at Nikola in this particular thing, you can see that Nikola is at the very, very lower end of the price range for the last year. So this would be the 52-week low. This would be the 52-week high, and it's showing you where it is, very, very close to the low. So you can, if, if, you're, if you're interested in looking for opportunities, this chart can help you with it. And I like this chart. Okay, just something I like. All right, so I want to talk about the market. This is going to be a fictitious story, okay? On this particular day, the market is going up. This is an up day. All signs indicate that the market is heading north today, which is good. And I already know that because I've been listening to my girlfriends, and I've been looking at the CNBC chart futures, and I already know that the bulk of my stocks that I'm investing in are heading for an up day, okay? So first thing I want to explain is when the market opens at 9.30, it generally opens in a fury, okay? That first hour, the futures are dictating what's going to happen to those stocks. I typically will not try to get into that madness at all. I just watch it. Or maybe I don't watch it. Maybe I go take a shower during that hour and get ready to go to work. Because what I don't want to do is try to jump in to that madness. All right? If you watch a stock futures on CNBC and one, let's just say, for example, that Apple says it's going to be up a dollar fifty, the moment 930 hits, that stock goes up almost instantly. So you can't ride that wave. And I don't think you should try. In that one hour, I feel like the market's mind is already made up. And then futures, it, what, what's it going to do after that instantaneous change? What's it going to do? Probably continue on some kind of trend that I don't feel I have a handle on. Yes. Do you know how to do you know how to find the futures on the on the app on the NBC app? On the CNBC app? On the CNBC app, yeah. Yeah, you're you have to go you have to go to the watch list. Well, I have the watch list and I have extended hours, but I didn't see that like that graph that you had, you know. Well, I mean? I, I'm keep in mind that I'm doing it on my laptop, not on my phone. Okay. Okay. I'm I I'm more of a laptop guy, right? So, uh I typically do it on my computer and what I what I'll do is the watch list is actually not very much bigger than, than your phone screen looks like. And what I do is I, exp I have a touch screen computer and I just expand it so I can look at it. And out of the, I'll be watching TV maybe in the morning having a cup of coffee, but as the futures change, the screen almost blinks and I'll see it like with my peripheral vision and I'm doing this when I'm watching TV. Okay? So I'm a real... <laughs> I'm an addict. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bill. So yeah. if you so during the first hour you try not to buy anything. That's what you're saying. I pretty much stay out of the first hour. But if there is a there's an option that you hold that you you want to sell, you try to do do you normally sell during the first hour? No. And I'll explain I'm getting to that. So I will explain that to you. This we're at, we're talking about an imaginary day here. And I want you to 
I, I see, I make sales and buys and changes to my portfolio during different times of the day. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to talk about here. Okay? Look, I think it's great that people are addicted to stock options. I really do. Because if they weren't, they wouldn't always be putting their money in the market. And we need that money, right? We need investment. We need constant investment. That's what keeps the machine moving, all right? I kind of believe that the um, bulk of the people who are doing this today, they can't help themselves. They probably can't. They got to be in it. I mean, when things are good in stock options, boy, oh boy, are they good, okay? Uh, in, in April, I went to Florida for five days. I flew there on a Tuesday. I left on a Saturday. I made $100,000 in four business days. Four business days. It was, it was Apple earnings season. I think I had like a hundred, I think I had a big bet, like about 150,000 on Apple. And I made 100 grand in four business days. It was freaking awesome. Freaking awesome. Okay? Boy, boy, did that feel good. It was like, uh, it was like falling in love all over again. <laughs> you know, it sure did warm my heart, I'll tell you. Yeah. I just want to stay in that moment for a minute. <laughs> that was real nice. That was real nice. Clearly, I'm, I'm an addict now, uh, you know. Clearly, I am, okay? So I would, main thing before we move on, I would say in this, in this first hour, the futures are dictating what's happening. It, it happens instantly. Then what happens after that is anybody's guess. And I try not to jump on that train ever. I just watch it. I just watch it and see what happens, okay? And anything can happen. Right? Okay. The next phase of the stock market I call the coffee break. Okay? You, if you watch the market and you watch your stocks, one of the most clearest things that you will see during the entire day usually happens at 10.30. 10.30... Whatever the heck's, remember we're talking about an update here. So whatever the heck is going on with the stock, it's going to do what it's going to do for the first hour. And then when you get around to 1030, there's almost always a pullback. It's not 100%, but it's almost always a pullback. There's an adjustment around 1030 that sometimes will last another hour or so. I call it the coffee break. So if, for example, on this particular day, this up the day, I've made up my mind that I'm buying some stock. The coffee break is not a bad place to buy it. Okay? If we go back to the first hour for a minute, oftentimes I go back and look at the high that happened before the coffee break. So if I'm watching Apple, and let's just say that Apple popped $1.75 in the first hour, that's an important number to me because I've often noticed that at the end of the day, a, a whole lot of things are going to happen during this day, which I'm going to explain, but at the end of the day, the stock often revisits the high point of the very first hour where all the fury is going on, okay? This is my observation. I'm not a professional stock option trader, but I look at the market every day, and I pay attention to this stuff, and these are trends that I see, and I want to share them with you because I think it's important, and I think that you'll begin to see them as well. I would say it's the most obvious move of the day. So if I want to buy, for example, Apple, in this scenario, if I want to buy Apple, a good time to buy it is I pay attention to the fact that it went up $1.75 was the highest amount it went up in the first hour, and I'm going to watch this coffee break. I'm going to be very attentive to this coffee break. 
I almost don't care what happened in the first hour other than the fact that I want to know what the high of the hour was. And I can find that out easily just by looking at the day chart and seeing exactly what the highest number was. And then at 10.30, if it pulls back and maybe I only get a 50 cent break, I'll be very happy with that. And then I'll jump in at that point and buy it if I intend to buy it. Keep in mind, I'm not a day trader. I'm still going to buy options out over earnings and all of that. I'm not saying this is a day trade. I'm saying I'm in a buying mode. I've made up my mind the night before, the day before, the week before that I'm buying Apple. And I'm going to buy it at the coffee break. I'm going to wait for my discount. I'm not going to jump on that train and try to get in there. Because I've tried that already. And I got burned. Or it just doesn't work. You don't have any time anyway. It changes instantly. It has its own mind. And I don't like buying there. I like buying here. Where I have an opportunity to watch it. Sometimes it will pull back for the almost the entire hour. And you can find yourself at maybe 11.30 getting even a better discount. But it's a game like anything else. Anybody who tries to time it, you, you already know about it. Okay? If the markets are down, I would say the coffee break, it's not the same thing. So if you're looking to buy a put, and the market opens up down, the coffee break doesn't, in my opinion, does not go up again. It doesn't do the opposite. I can't find a distinct pattern on the coffee break if the first hour goes down. I can't find it. So to me, it's too erratic, and I don't like doing puts anyway. Anybody knows me knows I don't like the puts. Uh, they're so damn dangerous, and uh, it, it happens so quickly, and everything is backwards, and it really still confuses me to this day. Even after three years, it still confuses me. I'm just not comfortable with it. And there's a look. How many stocks are on the on the stock market? Okay, I'll just find something else I want to invest in. I don't need to do a put unless I saw the most amazing put in the world. Okay. So why else do these guys go to get their coffee? Because they're freaking addicts, all of them. The gamblers. They need their jolt, right? They're, they need their jolt. They need their coffee. Okay. The next break, let's call it the lunch break. If you're watching the market all day, sometime around 11.30 to maybe 1.30, things really slow down. Whatever happened in that first fury of an hour, that excitement is gone, okay? And things move a lot slower. The moves are less erratic. The volatility is down a little bit. Not always, but the trend tends to be that way. Things slow down. So I imagine, I came up with some of these names because I'm imagining what's happening. What's happening? Why is the volatility down? Why is the activity down? Easy. They're all freaking addicts, these guys, all these professional traders. They went out to lunch at the Capitol Grill a couple of blocks away. They had a few of these old-fashioned cocktails. They're getting a little buzzed. Yeah, I think that's what I imagine that they're doing. Do I know that they do this? No, but I imagine that they're doing it. So between the hours of, say, 11.30 to 1.30 or noon to 1.30, whatever you want to say, the activity is less. So if, for example, you've got some errands you want to run, this might be a good time to go do it. Okay? Do things like leave your office. If you're intently trading options and you're doing this like professionally or trying to do it professionally and you got a lot of money in there and you need to keep your eyes on what's happening, you don't stare at a screen all day, do you? Nobody wants to do that, right? So this is a good time to go out and do the things you got to do. You got some business you got to conduct, go, go do it and come back. Come back later on. Come back at 1.30. Actually, maybe you shouldn't come back at 1.30. Okay. Because after you've had a couple of cocktails at the Capitol Grill, and uh, you're, you're slightly toasted, you got a good buzz on, you need a nap, right? So that's what I see comes next. 
let's call it from 1.30 to 2.30. It's nap time. Okay? You're going you're gonna to take a little siesta. <laughs> you're going to put your feet up. Relax. And by the time you wake up at 2.30... Now you're ready to get back in the game for where the real action is going to start to happen, okay? So they wake up and they prepare. So what are they preparing for? I follow a guy on YouTube. And he's also on some other sites that I frequent, that I frequent, and I've learned some cool stuff from him. And his name's Kenny Glick. Kenny's thing is, don't tell me how much, don't tell me what you did this morning, don't tell me what you did at lunch, I don't care, I don't care, talk to me at 320, that's one of the things that he says, talk to me at 320, and what he's really saying is that the action does not happen until 320, now if any of you are paying attention when you're watching your stock portfolio, your stock option portfolio during the day, Usually 3.20 to 4 o'clock is another fury. Things start up again, and they start moving. So if I'm selling, if I now just imagine that I bought my apple at the coffee break. Now three weeks have passed. I'm up $9,000, hopefully. 3.20 to 4 o'clock, that's the time. If I'm selling, that's the time I want to sell. On good days, on strong days, on up days, very often the last hour of the day or the last 40 minutes of the day looks an awful lot like the first hour of the day. And many times you will see in between 3.20 and 4 p.m., you will see it re-hit or even surpass the highs of the first hour. So in my opinion, the two most important things you want to be thinking about is watching a little bit of what happened, or you, you don't actually have to watch the first hour, you just have to go back and look and see what the highs were, okay? Because it gives you a little piece of information that I think is, is helpful. Nothing I'm saying is happening 100% of the time, obviously, you guys know that. but. At 3.20, you will often see it hit the high again for the first hour and possibly even surpass it. And if you see that happening and that trend continuing, I'm often hanging on to maybe the last 10 minutes of the market. But be careful how much time you wait because uh, sometimes if you're trading a stock like Apple, It'll probably sell very quickly. Big name companies, there's tons of volume that's being traded with those, and there's always a million buyers to buy it. But if you have some kind of obscure stock that you're thinking about dumping on any particular day between 3.20 and 4 p.m., don't wait till you get too close to that close date because you might not sell it. It takes longer for obscure stocks that don't have the popularity of the big names, it takes longer for those to sell. There's less buyers for them, so you want to start selling it maybe a little early. 3.20 you could start selling it, or maybe even a little before, depending on how obscure it is. If you, heard, if you were walking down the street and you heard a shoeshine boy give you a tip about a stock you never heard of, and you didn't want to tell Larry Steinhouse because he would yell at you for not trading, for trading a stock that wasn't in your six, and you kept your mouth shut about it, you might want to start a little earlier to dump that stock, okay? All right. So Kenny, like I said, says, see me at 3.20, right? And I've already talked about between the hours of 3.20 and 4 p.m., and about how the highs of the morning will return in the final push. So to me, I'm almost always buying at the coffee break. Okay? And recently, one of the reasons I wanted to do this presentation is because 
Larry and I, we bought a bunch of Apple earlier in the week. Was it Monday? And we both didn't wait for the coffee break. So we both bought too early, and then we watched it go down more on the coffee break because we didn't do what I'm standing up here telling you to do. If there's a psychiatrist in the room, I'd like to meet with you after this meeting. I need help. Okay? Do I know? I did this presentation before. I knew it when I wrote this thing, but I still didn't follow my own advice. Okay. So let's talk about a couple other things that I do that might be slightly different from what Larry teaches or just slightly, they're still in the rules, but I do things a little bit different. Okay, so the rules say that you want to look for, you know, the cheapest option that makes sense for you. So you're looking for something that's cheap. And maybe if I was looking at this chart for Apple, Something cheap would maybe be like uh, 120 strike price for seven dollars. You know, the bid is seven dollars. The ask is 705. Maybe I'm get in there at seven dollars and three cents or something. But that price of the option, you're paying seven dollars per contract, not per share, per contract, right? So if I bought ten contracts, it's freaking seventy dollars. Considering the amount of money I'm risking in the market on, a, on any particular day on a trade like Apple, I, I think like when I made 100 grand, I had 150 in there to do that. I don't really care. But to me, I started thinking to myself, the cost of the option isn't that important to me. And I found myself gravitating up the chart gravitating up the chart and buying down the strike price. Meaning, so as I go up higher in this chart, over here, for example, I might take the, the dollar five call between 1675 and 1695, I'm gonna put in 1685 and I'm gonna get the dollar five call. And I'll tell you why I wanna do that. The minute I buy that stock, and it shows up on my position page, it's green already. I like green. <laughs> I don't like red. I like green. It makes me feel more comfortable. Did I buy that equity down artificially? Who cares? Yeah, I did. So what? I like being in the green. Gives me more flexibility. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. First of all, I think it gives me a better chance of having success with this stock. Because I did, okay, if I went with the 120 call, I just bought it down $15, right? I bought it down $15. Did I pay more? Yeah, but so what? I'm pro I could be risking $50,000 in this trade. What the hell do I care about? A thousand bucks or 1,500 bucks. I, like if I lose on the trade, I'm going to lose. I won't even be able to calculate like what the actual cost of the option cost me in addition. I don't even care. When you're down, you're down. It's just, you just take it, right? The dollar five gives me $15 of insurance I'm buying. And I like that because I feel as if I've got a $15 head start. I got a $15 better chance of having this stock be green when I buy it and maybe even stay green because stay green and I've had that happen when you buy in the money deep in the money like I'm talking about doing sometimes what happens is it's green instantly and it stays green if it, if it goes up and it has a couple of strong days or a strong week or a strong two weeks I'm up enough in the first week maybe that I don't even have to worry about it going anywhere near red and why does that give me flexibility? Because I can sell it at any time now. So suppose I bought a bunch of Apple, 
It's green the moment I bought it. It goes further green and, and more successfully green. I'm feeling pretty good about that trade. And then I'm watching, I'm not watching my girlfriends anymore because now it's later on in the day. I'm watching other people from Fox Business. And I usually put on Fox Business and it's on all day in my house. I am definitely the guy who walks into the room and turns all the TVs on. I turn them on. TVs go on wherever I'm around. I want to know what the hell's going on in the world, especially with the stock market. I want to know what's happening. And they also inform me of politics and other things that could happen that could may maybe possibly affect your thinking for the day. Not like I'm making changes all the time for every possible political thing, but for example, like when the hacking of that gas uh, system a month and a half ago, right, where, where uh, these Russian spies were hacking the gas system, I was immediately thinking like, well, what could I do? Is there something I could do to, to benefit? Now, I, I didn't really come up with anything, and I just let it be. Then I actually went out and got some gas. Um, and it scared me, actually, because I went out and I went to three gas stations and didn't have any gas. Right? I don't know if you experienced that. I did. And I, I lived in Warminster, and three, three stations were already out of gas uh, at around 11 o'clock in the morning, which was weird because I heard about it on the news. And maybe it was the next day that that happened, maybe with the gas. So let's just say that my apple is up. And some kind of news story happens. Like Mark Zuckerberg gets arrested for picking up a hooker on Hollywood Boulevard, right? That would be something that would tank Facebook stock, right? The flexibility I have, because my stock is green, I dump my Apple, I get my whatever money I got, 75000 I immediately put it into Facebook puts to try to take advantage of what's happening there. I'm not saying I do those kind of trades. I'm saying that you have the flexibility to possibly do something like that if your stocks are green. But if my stocks are down $8,000 in BABA or something stupid like JNUG, which I am in right now, and I have no idea how that happened. <coughs> I'm not down much. It's just a little bit. <laughs> He's the one that signed off on JNOG, not me. Right? That's what keep that little keep that Aladdin thing over there. Right? So I like the idea of having the flexibility to do something about it. Okay? Does that mean I'm gonna act on it? Not not necessarily, but I like having the ability to do it. If your stocks are down a bunch, you you really you're not gonna take an eight thousand dollar loss to try to put it somewhere else. That's probably pretty dangerous. You're gonna most likely ride out your option and hope that it comes back over time. But it would be a really gutsy move if you did dump something for $8,000 loss and took the balance of the money that you had left over and invested it in something else on that particular day that you thought you might be able to get a kick rebound back for. So I like the idea of being green. I love to see them being green in the front Staying green if they can. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens some of the time. If you buy well, you can do it. Okay. Some basic formulas that I use. <clears throat> so if you haven't seen this, this chart, these are just different things that I've picked up from people in the school. The... The first, you see all the definitions on the left-hand side that are in red. You'll see the mark, the strike price, the intrinsic value, the time value, the break-even price. Okay? And then the formulas are, are pretty simple. So it's, it's a strike price plus the mark, which is the option price that you actually paid for the stock. Okay? So the strike price plus the mark equals your break-even point. If you want to know where you're at to break even in your stock, you need to cover the strike price <clears throat> plus the amount of the option that you paid for. Okay? There's a couple other things over here like the mark minus the strike price equals the intrinsic value. It's pretty simple stuff. But 
uh, I think it's important if you don't know these things, you should take a picture of it and you should start to look at it. When you've got a couple of so you might you might find yourself in the future having an eighty thousand dollars in some Facebook trade, hoping to ride it up into earnings period. And you want to be able to calculate some of this stuff and know what the hell you're doing, right? And th these are I'm not saying that I um, I'm Mr. Calculator, but I want to know what these things are. I want to know these numbers. I want to know where I have to be when I set my alerts. These little formulas help, okay? The price of the option minus the intrinsic value equals the time value. Easy stuff, okay? So let's look at the lower section, which you'll see the option price, the strike price, the rate of return, and then a formula here on the right-hand side. Uh, John Baum helped me come up with this, okay? So this is something that John showed me how to do, and this is for covered calls. So your option price, your strike price, and your rate of return. So what, what the formula is, is the option price divided by the strike price equals your rate of return. If you're trying to guess, so you're looking at, you're thinking of doing some covered calls. Okay, you go out and you buy some stock. You use this formula to calculate what kind of rate of return you think you can get, okay? And that's all this is. It's pretty simple. And if you're thinking of buying cover calls, you want to know what kind of rate you're going to get. A lot of them sometimes are only going to give you 1% or 1.5%. In this formula, this was one of the ones that I chose. I chose it because it was going to make 3.3%, all right, on my money in a, in a, in a week. Five business days is not even a week. It's five business days. Right? So if I bought it, well, actually it is a week because if I bought it on a Friday, for example, I'm selling it and getting my money back on the following Friday. So it's just some simple formulas and I, I, I keep expanding the things that I think are important and as I do that, I'll put them up here so you guys can see them. And it's just like where my mind's going. I'm trying to learn and understand as much as I can about what happens during the day where I think you should buy, where I think you should sell, what formulas I think are important. I'm not filling this chart with just anything. I'm filling it with things that make sense to me, things I think you should know about. You know, you certainly should be able to do this calculation. Now, I talked to Cover Call Paul, and he said he just looks at the charts, he just looks at it, and he knows if it's a good deal or not, and that's fine for him. It doesn't mean it's wrong or anything. But I think it's important that you at least use this when you're thinking about doing a cover call so you get acclimated to it and you understand it. And then maybe you'll do as many trades as he does to a point where he doesn't even need to use his calculator. He just looks at it and he knows it's a deal. Okay? But I like the formula. I like it a lot. This um, option price divided by the stock price equals the rate of return. I want to know my rate of return before I buy this thing. Okay, and I also use the tool on TD Ameritrade. I know like Larry doesn't use it, but I like to use it. If you haven't used the tool, you just go to the options menu, and then the options menu will pop up, and you can select covered call, and then you can select the stock you want to buy, and how many contracts of that you want to buy, and then you can Go into the option chain and select the, the um, option price that you're going to buy. And you can ha take a moment to calculate your rate of return right on that page, right? And then when you hit trade, it buys the stock and sells your cover call instantly. And I like that a lot. I like that that page. I think it's cool, especially if you're just doing your first covered call. I know that Paul doesn't really use it, and I'm not sure if John does or not. Do you use it, John? Do you, do you use the tool? Yeah. Okay, so he uses it. Larry doesn't. So, it, it, you know, everybody has their own opinions. That's cool. I just think it's a cool tool. I like it. I like being able to push a button, knowing what I'm going to make, Knowing I got my numbers straight, I can take my time, look at the chart, 
I can look at the options chart. I can look at what I'm buying. I push one button and it activates instantly. Both trades. It happens, all of it happens instantly. So I think that's really cool. So there's the names of everything that we talked about today. Opens in a fury, coffee break, l lunch break, nap time, closes in a fury. Watch the trends. <laughs>